Thank you uh, for coming, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this, is a, a, this event is run by Genomics uh, Toreo in association with the Otago Museum. Um, as part of a series of events that we're running over the next few months associated with our exhibition next door, which uh, after, well, well, after this event is over, the door will be open so you can go and see the exhibition if you haven't already. And so I expect to see you in there. And I will be asking questions as you leave to make sure that you've learnt everything. Um, uh, so my name is Peter Deaton, I am Director of Genomics Aotearoa and I'm actually going to get out of your way really quickly. We've brought here some of the smartest people in the country uh, to talk about different aspects of genomics and how it's going to change your lives and I hope you take the opportunity to grill them intensely. <coughs> I've certainly told them that you're going to all ask nasty questions and if you don't I will come in and, um, and be angry with you. Um, but uh, we are, have um, awesome people who uh, we're going to be introduced in a moment but I just wanted to start just by thanking you all for coming and introducing our fantastic compere for the evening. Is that the right word? Adjudicator. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Professor James McLaurin. Uh, James is from the philosophy department here at the University of Otago and is well known as a raconteur and a wit. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> So now just to, just to raise expectations, um, but James is also uh, interested in how new technologies get incorporated and how, how society deals with new uh, technologies and how we might use new technologies or modify the way we think about new technologies to make sure they are a benefit to us. So I, we thought absolutely ideal person to talk about genomics, which is this technology which is going to change your life. So James, take it away. Thank you, Peter. No pressure, then. <coughs> Kia ora. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Lovely to see you. Uh, it's not the most clement of uh, Dunedin spring days, but here we are. Um, so we do have this remarkable group of people here tonight to talk to us about the brave new world that is genomics in Aotearoa. Uh, we are going to, uh, so I'm going to give you sort of the structure of the evening, and I'm not going to say much despite Peter's, you know, building up. Um, so here's how the evening's going to work. We've got an hour and a half, and it, that's really nothing. I, it's going to go past in a flash. So uh, what we're going to do is that I will introduce each of our panelists pretty briefly, and then they've agreed that I can ask them all a quick-fire question. And the more important bit is they've agreed that they will give me a quick-fire answer to my quick-fire question. So that's just going to give you a little bit more information about the work that they do and about genomics and you know, the future. Uh, so, uh, we'll get through the introductions. I'm thinking pretty quickly, and then we're going to get on to the panel discussion bit, uh, which I think will be a little bit about conservation, and a bit about health, and a bit about ethics, and maybe the effects on Aotearoa of this uh, exciting new group of technologies that are coming toward us uh, at great speed. And then, and then, it's your go. Uh, so as we go through the evening, just, you know, if there's anything that strikes you as interesting or puzzling, concerning, exciting, just, you know, store it away. Uh, because I hope that we'll have about 20 minutes at the end for uh, Q&A, for questions. Um, so any influences in the room? Anybody made a YouTube video in the room? Well, you have now, uh, because we are being streamed live on YouTube as we speak. Uh, okay, so I think we're about there, and I'm going to get this piece of paper out because I'm not a geneticist, genomicist, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I'm not a scientist, let's put it that way. So if I don't have this little piece of paper, I will get uh, the big words wrong to comic effect. Uh, so I'm going to start introducing from this end, going that way, uh, and then we'll have, and we'll have five questions as we go. Are you ready, panel? Ready. Yeah. Look at the name. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Professor Amanda Black uh, is based at Lincoln University and she is the Director of Bioprotection Aotearoa. Her research focuses on the health of soil ecosystems, particularly on understanding the relationship between gene expression and soil productivity. Amanda. Bioprotection. Amanda. <laughs> Do you like that? <laughs> this is what comfortable looks like. Um, so bioprotection Aotearoa is a big thing. Uh, I was there on the website today. It's, it's a big organisation. Could you? Yeah, I was. Could you tell these fine people about it? What do you do? What do we do? We um, we're a core of this, a group of people in a research platform um, with a whole bunch of skills that range from science, um, social sciences. Uh, 
economic and we're there to protect, protect our, our productive landscapes and that includes agriculture as well as conservation. So, and the difference between this platform is that we are guided by Te Aoha Gullies, so we have a very much an intergenerational sustainability approach to the research that we do. There you go. Quick fire. I, I think, think you'd agree. That's, that's quick fire. fire. Nice. Okay, okay, no pressure, Gemma. Yeah. Uh, so, Gemma Geegan, uh, whose name isn't spelled that way, no. uh, but that's how it's pronounced. Uh, many of you will know Gemma from stage and screen, no, from, the, uh, from being on the news quite a bit. Uh, so, Gemma works at the University of Otago and she uses metagenomics to reveal the diversity, structure, and evolution of the virus sphere. Examining the major evolution of viral infections, including our old friend COVID. Uh, so, I don't know about you, when I went to school, it was genetics. Uh, genomics wasn't even part of it, and I was better genomics, and I fell kind of behind. Uh, so, um, given that for most people, the metagenomics of the virus sphere sounds like a really good science fiction film, um, I would like you to please tell people what metagenomics is. Okay, so. If we understand that genetics is the study of genes and genomics is the study of gen genomes, then metagenomics is the study of all the genomes in a sample. So if, for example, I was going to sample your gut, I would not only sequence your genome, but I would sequence the bacteria and viruses and parasites and whatever else I found in there, all of those genomes. And I might even sequence the genomes of the plants and animals that you had for lunch that day as well. Um, so it's a way of capturing everything in a simple sample. Quick fire, please. <laughs> oh, I've got to say, I didn't get much past if, if I were going to sample your gut. That's not threatening. I don't know. Um, so we move on to Dr. Mike King. Uh, Mike has many claims to fame, but one of them is not being Josephine Johnston. Uh, Josephine was to be part of tonight's panel. Can't be here tonight at very short notice. So Mike, in the middle of the day today, said, ah, go on, I'll do it. Uh, so thank you very much, Mike. Uh, so Mike is a bioethicist. Uh, he's a former animal scientist, so he's got kind of both strings to his bow. He's the head of department at the University of Otago's uh, bioethics unit. Uh, he works on ethical, legal and policy issues in science with a particular focus on the implications of emerging technologies for humans and other animals. To get it right? Sure. Cool. Uh, okay. Mike, as a bioethicist, what is genomics allowing us to do in agriculture that you think is interesting now and why? Well, I think one of the things that agriculture is able to do now is make progress on a lot of um, important, sort of impactful things that they're currently having to justify themselves much more in relation to. So this is improving the welfare of animals, improving the sustainability of agriculture, um, and feeding a lot of people. And we need to double our crop production by 2050 in order to reduce food insecurity given the population growth that, that we have. With some genomic technologies, they're able to identify sort of productivity genes that are able to help address these sorts of things while also addressing some important um, other values that agriculture has been estranged from a, a little bit at times. Yeah. Super. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Uh, over to you, Justin. Uh, Justin O'Sullivan, <laughs> Professor Justin. I, I, actually, I haven't been giving everybody titles. I'm terribly sorry. I, I've met these people today, and I feel like I know them so well, I'm not really giving them titles. <laughs> Ask me at the end. I'll tell you what their titles are. Justin uh, O'Sullivan is the, de the Deputy Director of the Liggins Institute, um, and he uses genomics in precision medicine. And his group is currently investigating the genetics of many disorders, including Parkinson's, mood disorders, coronary artery disease, autism spectrum disorder, uh, diabetes, and much, much more. So Justin, precision medicine sounds to me like a sort of an aspirational goal, but you mean something specific by it. Um, so for people who don't know what precision medicine is, yeah, so how does it, it work? Well, there's a couple of terms, I think. So there's precision health, and precision health is basically using the information that we have about you, that we collect about you, that, that you have coming off your phones, everything else that you have, and information like your genomes, basically to find out ways to improve your health and longevity. Precision medicine is slightly different. So precision medicine is using the same information, but really it's about solving particular conditions and particular diseases, and trying to cure and address those specific things. 
So that's things like where we're looking at Parkinson's or Huntington's disease or cystic fibrosis, uh, breast cancer, various other things. It's about targeting those specific mutations and things to cure individuals in a precise manner. Precision health is different in that it's looking at long-term long effects using more things like polygenic risk scores and things to actually try and improve your health and longevity. And that's the difference. Right. I'm learning a lot. Uh, Tammy. <laughs> Lucky last. Don't uh, even get a last name. <laughs> Tammy Steves. <laughs> Tammy Steves. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Uh, Tammy Steves uh, runs the Conservation, Systematics and Evolution Research Team at the University of Canterbury. Her research uses genomic and non-genomic data to co-develop genetic management strategies for some of our terrors. Uh, rarest Taonga species. If you're not from this country, Taonga species is a treasured species. Uh, Tammy. What's that? Genetic management strategy. Which one? <laughs> why, why do we need them? What are you doing? Why do we need? Why do we need them? So as a conservation geneticist or conservation genomicist, what we worry about is the ability for small isolated populations to be able to um, respond to changing environments. And for us, that relates to how much genetic diversity they have. So a genetic management strategy seeks to minimize the loss of genetic diversity or genomic diversity over time. In the short term, so we can avoid really negative impacts of inbreeding, um, but also in the long term, so we can mount that adaptive response down the track, and particularly relevant now, given how rapidly the climate is changing. Kia ora. Kia ora. Great. Okay, okay so, so that's it. So, so we know everybody, so we're time, it's time, time to chat, chat now. Uh, he he said, said ominously, we must chat, or <laughs> Peter will <laughs> tell us off. Uh, so uh, I'm, I've got a few questions, and I'm just going to lead out with a few questions. Uh, but really, I just I want a sort of melee, if you would. Melee, that would be very good. Uh, and, and I have a sort of an order, but uh, who knows what's really going to happen. So um, we, we will start with Tally. Oh. Uh, Tammy Steves. Steves. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, um, lots of people have strange questions that uh, students ask them and the public ask them. I can tell you, if you're a philosopher, you get some very strange questions. Um, one of the questions that Tammy gets a bit. So, your work is all about understanding the genetics of endangered species and Taonga species, and why can't we? modify the genomes of those species to make them more resilient and then we wouldn't have to have all this conservation effort. Is, is that a thing? Right, is that a thing? So is it gene editing a thing, to, for example, to enhance um, conservation outcomes? Could it be a thing, I guess is maybe the way, that, way I would probably think about that. And it sort of depends, because it depends on what your outcome is. Um, so often, like I just said, in a, in a conservation management program, we're looking to have lots of diversity, so we don't have inbreeding, so we end up with this nasty thing called inbreeding depression. When we see inbreeding depression, it's often things like in a bird might be reduced hatching failure, it could be disease susceptibility. Um, so these are the kinds of traits that we worry a lot about. So people will say, well, can't we just gene edit that out of them? And um, in this space, if I were to, to cast a crystal ball into the future, if we were going to use gene editing to enhance conservation outcomes, we're likely going to start with resistance to pathogens, a very specific thing. So for example, in Australia, um, the, the crawberry frog is highly susceptible to something called chytrid fungus. Um, it's around the world and amphibians around the world. Um, that, that subspecies is extinct in the wild. They breed it in captivity. Every time they go to release it, the populations get chytrid, chytrid fungus and go extinct again. So there's a huge impetus to try and figure out what the genetics are that underlie chytrid fungus. So then the, a, the idea would be, if it's just a gene here or a gene there, perhaps we can edit it in such a way that when we go to release those frogs, they'll be resistant to chytrid fungus. So when we have a very specific pathogen that we're worried about, we're going to ask very specific questions about can we figure out what the genetics, the genes or gene regions are that underlie resistance to that particular trait. And if there's not very many of them, we could potentially gene edit them. 
But the trouble is, is that most of the traits we really care about, like that low hatching failure that we might see in a species like cockapole, it's very, very unlike, unlikely to be controlled by a single gene. It's much more likely to be controlled by many, many genes that are scattered throughout the genome, or maybe some of them are clustered together, or could even not be the individual genes themselves, but the incompatibilities between the parents of, of uh, this potential chick in this egg. So how we would go in and actually first even find the genes or the gene regions that are responsible for those things is incredibly challenging. And it's one of the things that, that my team is working on and we, don't, we are quite confident it won't be a single gene. So even if, even if we found a few genes, the trouble is if you think about your families or if you've only got yourself and your family then other people's families with siblings, unless they're identical twins, they look quite different. So what happens in our genomes when we go from being an, an individual to making our gametes, our sperm or our eggs, all of our, all of our um, uh, different variants for our genes get mixed up, which is amazing, because that's why we're all one in a trillion or zillion or Gogolplex, actually, I think, to be specific. Um, and yeah, yeah, I could, I could do it. There's a song, there's a really good YouTube song about it, actually. Um, and so the problem is, is we, we, we mix up all these variants of these genes. And so if they're scattered around the genome, how on earth do we keep them together? They might work for one generation, but what about the next generation, the next generation? So for some things, I think we will see gene editing at play, but for many, I think we're just going to have to get a lot better and a lot more at finding those regions and then managing what's there to the best of our abilities. Is that enough? <laughs> well, I was thinking, as I asked that question, I was thinking, maybe I've asked that question the wrong way around, because mm. so... You know, I, I, I think of our town and the species and I worry that they're not, you know, strong enough and fast enough and they can't get away from the mustelids and all this sort of thing. Could we gene edit the pests to make them less successful rather than the town and the species to make them more successful? Is that easier? Seems that less successful would be sort of losing function, not gaining function? Is that, is that easier in a, in a gene editing? I can tell I'm reaching here. Is that easier to do? I don't know if easier is the right word. I don't know, Amanda, do you want to take this one or shall I give it a punt? Gene editing. In invasive species. Um, I, I can give it a punt, so I think mean, I might circle back to you. Yeah, that's fine, I'm here. I got you, I got you. Um, so the world, the world of genes and gene editing kind of, um, to a lot of communities and public out there, kind of belongs to the team AT and the vaccine type um, thinking. And that's, that's actually um, probably the biggest thing that if you wanted to ever look at gene editing as a tool that you could use to manage the pests, um, that's, that's the kind of thing you have to overcome, not necessarily the technology, but it's, um, you know, communicating this and, and is this acceptable, how is this acceptable, and what boundaries is this acceptable, and then producing that policy. So that's, that's more the boundaries around whether we can use gene editing rather than the technology itself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, just, just, just before that goes. <laughs> yeah, no, no, actually no, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let it come back to you. Well, I mean, Amanda's picked up on absolutely the right point, right? So when we talk about this, it's not just about the technology, but it's the ethics and, and, the, um, and all of those other things that we need to be thinking about, whether it's law or, or um, whether it's, whether it's um, well, lots of things. I'm gonna look at, I'm looking at Mike to fill in the extra blocks because I'm, I'm losing words. But, but I will say it's a very different thing. So if we want to gene edit, um, wasps or another invasive species or mosquitoes to get rid of malaria, we're trying to kill it. We're trying to, to, to use an aggressive technology that will kill the thing. In contrast, if we're looking to enhance the recovery of a threatened species, we're trying to make more, right? And, and But why are we trying to make more? So are we trying to make more because we're, we're thinking about looking at conservation in a very traditional Western science lens where more is better and we all want kakapo in our backyard so that's what we're going to do? Or do we want more because we actually, we, they're a Mahingakai species and that, that, that communities want them back in their streams and, and want more of them. They want them to be big and resilient and tasty. So I think it really depends on what your question is, but I think 
um, not it, it not being my space, um, trying to kill something feels like it might be a little bit easier than trying to figure out how to not only just create more, but create, create populations and individuals that can both not just survive, but thrive. And I feel like that's a huge challenge, but I think Mike's thinking got something well, here. Could, could I just jump in there? So uh, my understanding was that um, gene editing for pest control usually focused on reproduction. Yeah. Um, and so in that case, just, just to probably spell out what, what you mean by killing there, it's not that this is a gene edit that's going to act like 1080 and cause something to die painfully or something like that. It's usually that an animal would, if it was successfully um, edited, unsuccessfully reproduce. And so then what you're doing is you're preventing animals from being born rather than killing animals that already exist. We know that killing animals that already exist is generally a bad, a bad thing for those animals, assuming they're going to otherwise go on to live reasonably happy lives. Um, but animals that um, uh, preventing animals from coming into existence is a whole different thing, right? And we generally think that it's fine to do that. So this is the advantage, it seems to me, that gene editing could provide for making progress on things that we currently value. And what gets in the way is being concerned about, um, about you know, is this in sort of um, changing nature, perhaps, where we're now going to have a sort of a, a garden rather than a wilderness because we're intervening in, in these, these sorts of things and suddenly um, you know, we're in control of, of, of nature. And, and, um, but what we're doing by not doing that is being sort of in control of nature in another way, which is saying, we'll just let pests go and we'll do a bunch of things that, make, that sort of kill them in harmful ways and we won't explore some perhaps more sort of uh, refined ways of, of making progress on those, those things. So Tammy and I actually know one another from being on a bioethics panel. Ah, <gasps> that's right. Free 2050. <laughs> <laughs> we do know this stuff. Um, and, it, and it is very interesting what it is that people are worried about. And so one of the concerns is that if what we're doing is trying to make this species less fertile, that somehow this will jump to some other species, might jump to us. Is, is this a wholly irrational fear that we might end up making the wrong thing infertile? Well, so on that, do you mean, because the, the, the risk with some of these things is that, that they'll just jump you know, the ditch and go to Australia for, for possums. Yeah, no, not, 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 so, yeah, so, yeah, so I agree. So, the, the yeah, making possums in New Zealand less fertile is a, yeah. is a good thing, but in Australia is a bad thing because the Australians yeah. like possums. They're otherwise sane people, but, uh, <laughs> but no, I was thinking of the people who worry that somehow the genes will jump from one species to another species via some vector. Scientists. Yeah, I know nothing about this. You can tell. Come on, I want help from the experts. Is, it, is, that, is that possible? Um, uh, unless they interbred and became a species which is very unlike right. I mean, So there's no chance that some virus is going to get a piece of DNA from this one. Put it into that one, he, he said virus sphere. <laughs> so, I, mean, I, I think that's I, unlikely. <laughs> so, horizontal, so horizontal gene yes. transfer yeah. happens in bacteria, yeah, right? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So they sort of swap genes around it a lot, but I think across species like yeah. between anim, you know, non-human animals and humans, that's a whole vertical thing, transfer right? is is incredibly rare. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like it's if you look for it, you screen millions of samples to find anything, and even then, the likelihood that it's something significant is infinitesimal. You know, I mean, you're talking about something that's going into some sort of virus or something else that could jump across species, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and and that, that doesn't happen that often. I mean, there are classic examples, of course. Um, but what you're talking about here, <laughs> leave, leave that that right. Right. <laughs> but what we're talking about here, you know, you're, you're sterilising animals and releasing animals. You can sterilise animals and insects in many different ways. You don't yep. have to do it using genetic technology, oh. and it's possible to do that. And people do it already. So you can do it using different technologies. Put them out there. Those animals are sterile. They breed, or they try to breed as normal. That reduces the population, and, that, and that's something that can be done now. That's and it is done in various places, right? It's not. That's not a technology that is some weird, wacky, you know, futuristic thing. That's that happens now. So I, th I think there are different ways to achieve the same thing, um, and technology is not always a solution, right? So maybe gene editing is not the answer for that. 
But gene editing in the terms that you're talking about, you take the gene out and you delete it, right? So it's gone. So there's actually nothing there to pass on, right? Because you've actually removed something from the genome. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a different thing there. And, and I think some of those concerns about these things jumping like that, they, they're based on old technologies and not the new technologies, which are very precise and actually can cut something out and remove it without leaving any trace of actually what was happening, except that the piece that was there is gone. And that's what we're talking about. We're not introducing something new. You're precisely cutting something out and removing it. Because of that, there's nothing to transfer. So I think there's, there's a lot of things here to take into account that, that mean that some of these concerns that you're raising are not really significant. Excellent. That's what I like to hear. Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can question these people more on this later if you want. Mike, I... Well, well, I just thought um, th there's, there's a big change that seems to have happened now, I think, between the way these technologies used to be done and the way they're done now. Yeah. And I think that it's, it's almost like we need to rethink these things. I, th I, th yeah. I, I think we've, yeah. Yeah, our current thinking tends to be informed by the debate that, that we've had in the past, which was, um, you know, transgenesis well, and yeah. very and, old tech. Yeah, I mean that's so, and it, it was imprecise. There was a lot of off-target effects, all, all that kind of thing. Now, there's some of these things that still happen, but it is much more precise now. That's my understanding. Is that is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. and so and also a lot of the changes um, that we're seeing in sort of released organisms, they're changes that could be brought about. Um, naturally, but because of transgenesis or, or, sorry, or gene editing, either of those, those things, you can do things like shorten the generation interval in plants. And so you could make a lot of genetic sort of progress in, in production in plants by just you know, having them reach maturity quicker. And so you can cycle through a lot more generations and go through breeding with gene edited crops. And then you can cross those genes out at the end and you can have um, plants that are released that aren't actually, they don't have any new genes in them, you've just, in the lab, been able to make a huge amount of progress. But those plants are produced through genetic technology. They're, they're produced through gene ed editing. Mm -hmm. And so currently, you can't release them in New Zealand, or it's extremely difficult to release them in New Zealand. And so even though they're plants that don't contain any strange genes, but they're produced through these technologies. So our sort of way of regulating these kinds of things is very averse to just the use of this, this technology to produce them. And that's because it was set, it seems to me, with this thing of mind of you've put a new gene in something and you're releasing it, it's a new organism. And, and our, our, I think our regulation. Key, I mean, the Sorry. key thing here is that, you know, you, yeah, you are talking about some old things. I don't really want to get into this topic too much, right? Because I think it harks back to some old conversations that maybe, you know, should stay where they were. Um, but basically I think, you know, I can, well I can't, but we can edit a plant or something like that. You wouldn't know we'd touched it. You could sequence it before, you could sequence it after. You wouldn't know it had been done in a lab or it had just occurred normally in the environment. There's no way you'd be able to tell. And I think this is something that, that's quite new and this is because of the technology around CRISPR. And so it's a basically molecular scissors and you target where they go. They cut the DNA, they change the DNA if that's your, your goal, but it's very, very precise. Right? And it goes and it happens and then the machinery is gone. And that's the key here, right? It, it, the, the technology has moved so far that you know, some of these questions are stuck in a point of view from 1980s or whatever, right? Um, and, and some of us were around and some of us were in nappies and various other things, right? You know, I mean, tech's moved a long way, and I think we have to allow that conversation to move with it. I could go to the pub in the 1980s, I'm just saying. Uh, yeah, okay. I guess there's one other thing, in, in the sort of the public's mind, or you know, in the voters' mind, there's a calculus about risk, which is risk is, you know, magnitude of harm times likelihood of harm. So when you say we've made the likelihood really tiny, if people in their own minds can inflate the magnitude of potential harm large enough, then we're still in the old-fashioned conversation. I guess you know, that's, a, that's a task for all of us, to, to learn about the new stuff. Brilliant. Lovely. Amanda. I think it's time for Amanda. Uh, so there's a, 
a conservation ethicist I quite like called Michael Soule, and he says that conservation biology is a crisis discipline because it's big and there's never enough money and there's never enough people and the projects you can do all seem you know vast and open-ended and so you're, you're always trying to have to, to triage and you always need as much help as you can get and uh, Amanda has done a lot of work with Māori communities in understanding the perceptions and the perspectives of Māori communities and so I want to know how that is as, as a help what does that give us and what's it like doing that work? It's challenging. Um, so my other half of my job, I'm not directing, I'm working co um, you know, and some of that's using genomic tools to figure out what's happening, is there a solution, um, tools management, and um, so I'm just listening to your talks and, you know, technology, which I follow to a certain degree, um, <laughs> not a geneticist. Um, but you're talking about the conversations in the past and the very, very nuanced in those conversations. Because in the marginal communities, they can't distinguish between the past conversations and the new technologies. Um, they can't distinguish between because of the treatment, the intergenerational treatment and trauma. And so that's all wrapped up in a very complicated situation, um, colonialism and institutional racism. And so when you go in there as a researcher, it does help that I'm Māori. Um, and I grew up in those environments. Um, Western trained, actually Otago was my university. Um, so that helps get a foot in the door. But then the expectations on you are a lot higher because you know the rules. And so everything, when you come across a new technology, like we, we did want to grow the soils to try and figure out whether there's areas where the pathogen might have not gone and why is that. So we then look at um, gene classes that, that produce um, antimicrobial activities that might help if it travelled effectively and naturally. And to introduce a concept like that, because first we had to um, sequence an entire species of fungus and an entire species of bacteria. And that alone, having that conversation is quite frightening. Because when you bring out things like you know, sequencing, that's a really hot topic for them because sequencing takes control away from them. And that's what I think fundamentally people are frightened of. It's that, you know, you can throw at them the facts and the figures and the risks, and that just does not help, that, that it's not going to cut through. Um, you have to understand what their fears are, you have to understand what their values are, and, um, and from there you kind of work out what are the soft areas that you can build that trust and relationship with. And I have that now. So I was allowed to sequence around Tāne Mahuta and, and um, you know, their very special trees and their very special ecosystems because they always retain control of the data. And I think bringing those conversations, you know, when you get into the point of gene editing, because for them it's all the same, you know, they don't care. It, it's all the same sort of, you know, institutional racism, colonisation, um, no power, no voice and stuff like that. Um, it's just really developing that trust. So, you know, so this is, and it's contextual based, so it's not going to be a blanket thing, it's going to be, and they are pragmatic because at the end of the day, they don't have any money, you know. Their priorities are this high, and usually at the top of the community they're dealing with is need of power, or something like that. So you just got to remember that the person that you're dealing with, and there's five parents, like, they're usually running the school bus, or, you know, they've had death in the family, and, and stuff like that. And so and there's a whole lot of empathy that comes through with that. So, you empathise, you empathise with their situation, and then you start to talk about what's important, and then you, so you develop that relationship with them, and then you start to talk about the tools and the potential for that, and in a way that they can understand that it's going to be beneficial. Of course, then some are not, and we come across that, but the ones that I've worked with understand that they trust me, and they understand what I'm trying to do with the tools, and I've brought it into the environment, and. Um, yeah, and so we have that kind of reciprocated relationship. And that's what I try to do when I work in, so I work in agriculture as well. And the difference between conservation and agriculture is you can always get money for agriculture. Yeah. Very yeah. transactional <laughs> relationship, yeah. right? You know, you, you treat your end user, your agricultural companies as like friends with benefits. You know, everyone understands <laughs> what's involved. Um, with conservation, you're very much dependent on goodwill of communities because there is literally no money in conservation and it's a political football. Like it's always, you know, you get, it gets a lot of air time, um, it gets a lot of politicians, but actually very little money is transferred 
Um, so it, it, again, it's very nuanced, but that's why it's incredibly important when you're trying to protect tiling species and conservation to have those relationships with the communities. And it's literally the marginal communities that are keeping the pests bay. They do the pest trapping, you know, um, all the monitoring and stuff like that. It's not, and they don't do it with money. They just do it for the love, really. So yeah. So I'm, I'm just hoping for a lot of amendments <laughs> because that seems really hard to do and I just think, you know, lots of communities. But, uh, I mean, what's our reach? And could we, could we get some more amendments? Do we need more? Well, I mean, it's part of the philosophy that I'm bringing into the core is that to get, you know, because you often get asked like, yeah, sorry, no, I'm <laughs> Try and make them understand that you need to develop relationships with these people. Yeah. Um, and it's a continual thing, it's not send an email or something like that. It's like they have to understand who you are. It's the first thing you do is like, what kind of person are you? Do I trust you? Do I like you? Am I going to invite you around? And things like that. And understand and empathise with the positions they're in because they've got tons of things going on. Um, so that's the, the philosophy that I'm trying to instill. And the research is under the core. It's like, you know, if, yeah, it's, it's having that place-based research that's going to have that impact. And so I'm very much interested in having an impact on the research I do, rather than building my CV. It's not how I roll. It's very much the same in health, yeah. right? So yeah. it is. It is the same. There's, there's no question. This is the same. So, I mean, we talk, I was talking about the tech before, but that was more about the way the question's phrased yeah. and then the actual the point you and the point you're raising is quite right. It's about the communication with the people, explaining what, what's going on and, and getting that trust to talk and to actually do these things with people. And it is with people, right? And it has to be co-developed. It has to be done with everybody. It's not something that we do to people or to communities. No. That makes it very difficult though, doesn't it? I mean, so no one likes having things done to them and there's obviously a big history there of, of that. Um, it's, it takes so much time then to make progress in these areas and I, I don't know about you, scientists don't seem always great, well in fact ethicists are the same, not, not, not that great at maintaining, sort of, now it comes you know, out. doing all of the relationship work that's needed to try and make people trust you. I mean eth ethicists have a terrible record for, for trust, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> well because often, often ethicists, you know, say things and we know we'll say, say things and a bunch of people will disagree. Disagreement is our sort of bread, bread and butter. So. Um, and it can take quite a lot of time, effort, um, and it's not skills that people are often instilled with in our sort of training and STEM subjects and all of that, that kind of thing. So it seems like this is a problem where you have a vulnerable community that's made worse off um, and not being well catered to. Is there, a, is there a way to solve that or improve that that it isn't sort of take you know take a long obviously we can we can improve it by training people better and all of that but is there a way to support people to do that kind of work I think it's um it's, it's complicated because of the expectations that institutions have on metrics yeah um, and it's kind of filtering through in how you know PBO system instead of you know long list of Performance-based research fund. So that's how we get paid for doing research. Yeah, so basically we're judged on how many papers we produce in certain journals. Um, and that's what drives a lot of academics. And those journals are international journals, yeah, right? They're not yeah. local yeah. journals. Yeah, yeah. They're not, and they're behind paywalls. Yeah. And then yeah. understand the situation we're in, the Treaty of Waitangi, and, and that kind of partnership that we're trying to do. And so it, it's difficult, but also, you know, um, <laughs> academics are attracted to this life because they just don't like people either. They don't want to talk to people. They don't want to you look a little disillusioned, but it's going to pick up. Yeah. Fine. Amanda, just so it's not, I'll let you feel free to throw them this way if you yeah. want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. Well, there's a couple of things here, though. I mean, I think PBRF has been, uh, so this is a system for, for ranking everybody in the country and the scientists in the country, so we all get ranked, right? And, and so that has been largely driven by outcomes. 
but the, the next rounds are actually shifting. So yeah. the next round is shifting to more impact focus because it recognises that and that is being recognised and so it is shifting. And I, I mean, I think, you know, so that, that is happening and uh, whilst I agree that in the past it's been very outcome focused, I don't think that's necessarily going to be the truth in the next rounds in 2025 and going forward. Um, I also, you know, I agree that some people don't like to talk to people, but I, I do think that sort of stigmatises many of us and it's not necessarily true, um, particularly not in the areas where we work and I think where you work as well. So. Um, well, that's <laughs> 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 I'm not a we, we are diverse, we're strange in a lot of different ways. Um, yes, yeah, Tammy, you're... Sure, I'll say some things. Um, <laughs> so there's a whole field in, in feminist geography and social science around slow academia. And that when we think about our funding structures, that you know we've got to pump out a research idea and a research output in a very short period of time, they're structured in a way that doesn't let us actually build relationships. But I think I think there's a, there's there's I used to say there's more than one way to skin a cat, but then I realized that sounds gross. Mm -hmm. So now I say there's more than one way to peel a potato. So there's lots of ways to shift the way that we think about how we do science. And, and even our, our funding and our, and our assessments are, are much more centered on, on impact and, and, and give people space to build those relationships over time. But I'll talk just personal, I'll use a personal example. So I'm obviously not from here, I'm from Canada. I rocked up here, um, started working in the conservation space, knew very little about, about Aotearoa New Zealand, very little about Te Tiriti. Um, but as a Canadian, carried a lot of whakama around my own history. And, and then sort of had a bit of an epiphany when I had my second, my second child, which is my son. And I want, you know, I've got this insane privilege to work with fauna species. I need to do better, I need to be better in this space because when I first rocked up, I did the thing that academics are very, very good at. Hey, I've got this cool idea, are you interested? Right, so it's kind of like rocking up to the house, going inside and turning on the TV, right? And so, so what happened personally for me, and this isn't all about me, but I can talk about me, because I have, that is me, um, <laughs> is that I said, no, actually, now the way that I will, will enter into a relationship is these are my skills, are they of use to you? So, and if they are not of use to you, that's okay. Or if they're of use to you later, that's okay too. And, and, and a, a former student of mine equated that to walking into someone's house, maybe getting invited, and asking what's on TV. So you're coming into that space, but you're not dominating that space. And, and in terms of one way to do that, when I teach my undergrads, I teach that from day one. I te teach co-development and partnership models and taking things slow and understanding that building trust takes a very long time and losing it takes a heartbeat. Those really important critical things and, and although we have lots of stereotypes about who academics are, the academics that I see are not that stereotype and we have to work really hard to break it and, and to rebuild a system that actually is rewarded for impact and for these, these overwhelmingly outrageous partnerships that actually result in effective change. So there's lots of ways, I think, is, is, and it's the potato, not the cat. So, yeah, <laughs> kia ora. I was trying to think of pe it's appealing. I just think that's like a couple potato in a couple of ways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then I thought, well, having the way to Maybe I'll bring the peelers next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah you're always welcome. Yeah. Uh, okay, I, I, I think we could slightly change gear because I, I'm. <laughs> yeah, enough with this. Um, because uh, I want to get to a few different ideas, and I, I feel like it's time to focus in on. Justin, for a moment. Um, Thank you. So, so I think that I could well be wrong, but I think of what you do as requiring a lot of data, as you being a kind of um, big data um, person in health, or your field being a big data uh, field in health, and we're very familiar with the idea that, you know, in domains like that, it's a kind of winner takes most, and there are huge companies overseas, and all this sort of thing. So the you know it's it's hard for us to 
have enough impact because it's such a difficult and expensive thing to do. So I just thought that for the next couple of minutes, I'll give you all the money in the world. You ask later, I'll give it to you. Um, and I will say you can have as much money and time as you want, and given what we, can, what we know now, what could we do for the health of New Zealanders if, if Justin uh, were in charge? Well, you wouldn't want that, but, um, <laughs> well, you might not, but, um, so I think, um, uh, there's a good question, so, you know, I've been asked recently, and I gave a talk a little while ago, where it was about, you know, how, how can we live longer? How can I help you live longer? And my answer to that was, I can't help you live longer, you know, the diseases that are going to kill you are already there, they're already growing, your genetics have contributed it to, your environment has contributed to it, it's developing. The answer is not us. The answer is sequencing your children. And so if that were the case and you gave me unlimited funds, what would I do? I would sequence every child that was born in the country straight away. I wouldn't do the Guthrie card. Well, I'd use the Guthrie card. To Just explain to me what the Guthrie card is. So the Guthrie card is a test. So when you're born, currently now, there's a newborn screening program. In the newborn screening program, they prick the heel of your child and they take blood spots. Those blood spots go to these machines that are called mass specs. The mass specs basically tell you what's in the blood, the metabolites. What I would do with it would be to actually sequence the DNA. Because the DNA contains the information that determines the risk that you have for many different conditions. Childhood onset diseases, adult onset diseases, those things. If we were to sequence the DNA of the children when they were born, we could then calculate risk. And we can calculate risk. 23andMe have done a great job of calculating what the variants are that give risk to people. We could use that information. We'll get better at it as we go along. But doing that, we would be able to then put into place a preventative health system, which basically means that instead of you turning up with cancer when it's developed, you go into a system where we know you're at risk of that cancer, and over time you are monitored so that as soon as the signs appear, you can be treated in a precise manner. Other things we can do exactly the same things for. It would also allow us to develop new therapies that would help um, to really emphasize and to make sure that that period of longevity, that well-being that we all want for the maximum life quality is there. So you ask me that, that's my answer. And I know straight away that people will say, well, we shouldn't be able to do that. There are problems with that. We're sequencing people who have no disease risk. Um, well, that's just not true. Everybody has disease risk. Everybody has the variants or some variants that contribute to one disease or another. It's your intersection and the way you interact with your environment that really makes that risk realized or not realized. And so we're all on a scale. In fact, the scale's wrong because scale implies it's from one end to the other. The reality of it is, is we don't exist on a scale. Things like autism, autistic spectrum is not a linear scale between neurotypical and neuro, well, autistic. It's not a linear scale like that. It's actually more like a sphere and your position is somewhere within a sphere. Everybody has traits that are or are not autistic. It's just how much of that and how that's represented that really makes the difference. So it's about changing the way that we think. And so my answer is basically that. OK, who wants Justin to be king? <laughs> <laughs> no one. <laughs> So, so I, uh, I know that uh, Mike's at high risk for X and I'm at low risk for X, so that means I can have the cheeseburger and Mike can't. So, so we can tailor our, our lives based on what we know about our genomes. Yeah, well, you can have a cheeseburger. I mean, that's about moderation, right? I mean, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> no. I'm going to now worry a lot about having that cheeseburger. Yeah, cheese he's right? never I'm having the cheeseburger. Where is miserable I'm having the cheeseburger? You know, backslide uh, a bit with the cheeseburger, but now I don't mind. Perhaps that's a, the wrong example. Perhaps a better example is around APOE4, right? So APOE4 is, is a genetic variant that is associated with very high risk of developing Alzheimer's. Okay. And Alzheimer's, is, as we all are aware, is a horrible, horrible disorder. Now, APOE4, there is currently no cure. 
for Alzheimer's. My question to you is, if I could tell you that you had a very high risk of Alzheimer's, would you want to know? Would you want to know when you were young? I've asked people this question before. Some people say no, because they don't want to know. And that's perfectly fine, that, that's your right. And we don't have to tell you, even if we did see that in your genetic code, we, we're not supposed to tell you anyway, because it's a, one that we can't do anything about. But other people say, I would want to know. And the reason they would want to know is because it affects the way you live your life. You don't live your life trying to develop a nest egg or, or retirement saving so that when you retire at 65, you go, hey, cool, I've got 20 years of good life left. I'm going to go out. I'm going to live. Because you've got this very high risk of Alzheimer's. And therefore, when you get to 65, there's a very strong possibility that you will have Alzheimer's. Now, you might say, well, that's a theoretical thing, and that depends on sequencing people, and we don't do that now. You can actually get that information from 23 million places, right? But the key thing about that is you can also get that from your family history. Right? The, these things are not separated. Insurance companies use your family history because they know that your family history is strongly linked to your inheritance, to the genetics that you have. And their algorithms will predict these things with very high accuracy, hence the way they moderate your, your insurance fees, right? The stuff is, you know, I think sometimes we think that this is new technology and, and it's all new, but it's feeding off of and it's building up on information that we already have. And when you say we don't have big databases, I think that's another mistake that we make, right? You didn't say that, just said it seemed like you needed them, but... We do have them. So New Zealand has an integrated data infrastructure, which is something that we use. So we mine that now for health information. And that has the health records of, well, everybody in the country in it. It has social history, social records, all these records. It's an integrated thing. You have to apply it's very, very difficult to get access to, and you cannot identify any individuals from it, right? But it has this conglomerated data about our population, about the health of our population, which is really, really powerful. And that's the sort of data that a lot of places don't have. And so I think, you know, we have many advantages in, in what we have here already. There are some things I think that we, you know, like sequencing everybody that we should do. But, you know, that's a, a different matter. So I'm thinking some of the advantages we get from this is, is that people do know. So as you say, it's, it's better for individuals to know, but it also seems like it's better for society if individuals know. Um, it, it puts fewer people at risk. Um, you know, it allows people to make better choices just as we, you know, line people up for a superannuation scheme. This is starting to sound like our government in the future is going to say, well, actually, I, th I think we should just tell people because it really is better, so we shouldn't ask people. Well, I don't think it's that what do you think? much. I, I, I mean, I understand, kind of, I think I understand what you're trying to say, but I think one of the things to think about here is that we have a public health system, right? And to a large degree, you, you might argue that it works well or it doesn't work that well, you know, and the are examples where it doesn't. But it, it's also quite a good system in many ways, right? If you really need care, you can get it. And I think there's no penalty for information that's going to actually help that public health system, right? And so if we change the system so that we can do it in a preventative way, and we move to preventative sort of green medicine or whatever you want to call it, four Ps and some various other things. If you move to something like that, and you actually then start to change the way the system works, and change the cost impacts and the cost structure, many of you will get drugs, and you'll be prescribed drugs. And we know, or well, I don't prescribe drugs, right, drugs, um, but people that prescribe the drugs know that for 70% of you, those drugs aren't going to work. They only work on a small subset, right? And it's by testing them, does it work on this person? Well, that's an incredibly wasteful system. We can sequence, and we can tell you for some drugs, yes, this will work, this won't work. We can sequence you and tell you whether you should take warfarin or whether that's really bad for you, as an example. Right? There's all sorts of ones where that can happen. That tech is here. Why waste money on things where we know it's not going to work? It gives people false hope. It's not helpful. It's extremely costly. Doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's interesting. It's an interesting middle ground too, because even if I say I don't want to know about my risk for X, Y, and Z, my GP can know. 
facts that about that me that will stop, stop them prescribing stuff that won't work or might harm me. Well, and also the public health system could then know and plan for what, yeah, what um, yeah. disease prevalence we might have in the yeah. future and yep. all of that kind of thing. So that, that, that seems good, doesn't it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Think, Tammy. I'm just a little bit concerned about exasperating the inequities that exist in the current system. The public health system services some communities well and some communities very poorly. Yep. And if we feed into that same system, it's, there's, there's a difference between knowing and being able to do something about it yep. and knowing and having no control over what happens to you. So, I, so there's absolutely a much larger conversation here yep. around will this exasperate inequity or actually help address inequity? Exactly. But this is one of the key points, right? So I think equity is a really interesting thing, right? Treating everybody as if they're the same, treating you as if you're an average is not equity. That's not equitable, right? But you're right, some, some populations and parts of the country aren't served properly by a system. But the system has to change, right? Mm. That's about us addressing a system. These tools will allow us to change that system. They should allow us to change it. They should allow us to bring this out so that we can treat everybody equitably. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's the key thing, right? If it makes the money go further and the money go into the places where it needs to go, then that is treating people with e in, in an equitable manner. It, and I think that's, that's different. It seems like it, like, like it definitely could, but I wonder whether there's sort of, and there's all sorts of ways the current health system you know, could make a lot, of people, a lot of people better off, but they don't have access to it, mm -hmm. or they don't trust it, and so wouldn't, wouldn't, um, uh, wouldn't go there, or they find it, find it very difficult getting, getting there. And so it could be that there's the same sorts of issues to do with trust and things like that that would need to be worked through. And then if people have a whole lot of information about you that you perhaps don't know. I don't know if that well, it's would not about, be a good so, condition for trust. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't know that, I mean, that's a, that's a good point. You know, I don't know that it's about people having information that they know about you, right? I think, you know, there's always an opportunity to opt in or opt out to these types of things. Mm -hmm. And who holds that information and stuff? I, I think that's up to the individuals involved, right? Well, totally. But, but, but so the risk would be then that disadvantaged communities who don't trust will opt out. And, no. then, and, and then it's not addressing so, the equity I, issue. I can, see, I can yeah. see your point, right? Yeah. But, but that's an issue about trust that has to be developed. You know, and that's a larger social issue that totally. we have. Totally, yeah, that's right. And, yeah. that, and that's something that our society should be addressing. Mm. But there are ways that you can have this. So there, there's a UN declaration for the rights of indigenous peoples and things, which is really around the governance of these types of data, right? And New Zealand is a signatory to that. Um, whether or not that's a perfect thing, and I mean, I, I can see people shaking heads and stuff, yeah. and, just, and that's just, fine. But Amanda, job. jump in. No, 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 but we can put the information in the Hold communities that, that, that it belongs mm -hmm. to. It doesn't have to be held centrally in any way or anything like that, right? That, that, that's not what I'm arguing at all. I, I, can, I, I can see both sides. sides. I, I just, you know, I understand the, the technology yeah. argument and the benefits of all things considered equal, the perfect system, mm. and you're saying that technology could have changed the system, it doesn't. Okay, those systems never change because the people that benefit from those systems like it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and that's and that's where the inequity comes from. And I, you know, I know you must work with Ministry of Health, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, or work across about three ministries. They never change. And no matter how policy is developed, and um, all the goodwill that can go into it, it really has perverse outcomes mm. because of the people in the system that control it. So I, think, I mean, that, that I mean, okay. So that, that's yeah. It's not something I know much about, right? In terms of in terms of that and. I appreciate that, and I know there are problems. I think we have to realise here, right, that what I'm talking about now, and what we're all talking about now, and we've been talking about these genomic technologies and things in various forms, what you have to realise is we're not talking about the future. Right? This stuff is here now, right? Mm -hmm. We talk about inequality. Well, you want to know the reality of this? If you have got enough money, you can get this done now, right? Yeah. And that's it, okay? So people that have money and have the ability, they can do this. If you want to go out and you want to select your child to reduce the chances your child will have type 2 diabetes later in life, there are companies in the US that will screen the embryos for you and will select the ones that maybe have an extra month of life, okay? 
statistically. They will do that, you pay them, they'll do it. They'll implant it, you'll get it, and then away you go, right? This, this is not a future thing, this is now. So you talk about inequality, the inequality is already there. If you've got uh, cash and ability to do it, you can do it. But the Fans issue I think is the exasperation of the inequity, right? It's so, so if, if, so if more and more who have access to that technology get that technology, the gap gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and so I think, I really want to hear from Gemma, so I don't want to talk. I, and so, so I think that there's, I think the only issue I take is that the technology will fix the system. And the technology will not fix the system. No. The system needs, needs mass, and the system, actually the system's not broken, it was built this way. Yeah. So the systems need to be rebuilt, and there is an opportunity to feed in yep. equitable, responsible health care that is informed by technology. But sure. if we drive and we overpromise on as being a solution, that's where we run the risk of making a big mess. So that's, and, and yes. that's, that's purely down to my poor explanation of it, because <laughs> the technology is a tool, right? You're right. Yeah. It's the tool, and that's what the tool promises and how you can use a tool, but the solution is not the technology, the solution is social. And, and, and you're quite right, and that's purely down to my poor explanation, and that's it. Good, Good point. point. We need Gemma in here, Ooh. and I'm going to give you one of my favourite quotes just before we do. William Gibson, science fiction novelist. The future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. And it's true all the time. It's not like it just happened now, just over there. It's true all the time. Gemma, here we go, and we're off. Um, so, uh, people say data is the new oil, and uh, metagenomics uh, offers to give us lots and lots of data. Um, so I think of trying to find genetic explanations for traits as we were talking about earlier as kind of hunting for a needle in a haystack. And now as I learn about metagenomics, I'm thinking we've made the haystacks now the size of Belgium. Um, what's metagenomics good for now and what's it going to be good for? I mean is this a, is this a kind of constraint on us that it, there's too much data? Um, so what's metagenomics good for now? Um, so traditionally, um, to find a new virus or to find a new bacteria, um, you had to be able to grow it in a lab, right? And it turns out that the vast majority of viruses and bacteria you cannot grow in a lab because, well, we don't know how to. Um, so that's why we can't. And the, so we, we think we've um, sort of, we know about um, far fewer than 1% of um, the microorganisms that actually exist in the world um, have been sort of characterized. And, and so that means that when a new virus or a bacteria or pathogen um, emerges in humans, um, we can't preempt it. And metagenomics is the only reason why, you know, days after the first um, few cases turned up in Wuhan Central Hospital in ICU, we knew that it was a new coronavirus and we had a whole genome of that um, new coronavirus. And that meant that, um, you know, companies like Pfizer and Moderna were able to work on that. Um, on, on a genetic vaccine straight away. And so um, what's good for now is really precisely diagnosing infectious disease. Um, there are, of course, lots of ethical issues around this because, like I said before, it doesn't just um, sequence genomes of, of pathogens, it sequences your genome as well or whatever you're, you're sampling. So the sort of um, what we do with that data is also a a question um, to think about. And in my research, I'm um, interested in using another, under the umbrella of metagenomics, is metatranscriptomics. And that gives us another level of information because that tells us what those genomes are actually doing. Um, and so, and that's another way that you can identify um, uh, uh, parts of um, sort of activity of, of genomes. So if if metagenomics is sequencing all the DNA in a sample, metatranscriptomics is sequencing all the RNA in that sample. Um, so that's a whole other can of worms in, in terms of data. And I think the biggest limitation we have at the moment um, is one, we obviously need to address the sort of ethical issues around metagenomic sampling and, and who that data belongs to, but also we're really limited by our computational tools. So we have the technology to generate loads and loads of data. And as a researcher, 
that's what we do. We generate lots and lots of data, and you might use it to answer your one question. But um, at some point, we're going to have to stop generating data and look at curating and generating new tools to make the most out of these data, because they exist, and we're, we're ever creating more. But um, we don't have the, the computational um, tools or ideas to yet, I think, make the most of all of this. Is AI going to ride to the rescue? So we've had these great, uh, amazing advances with protein folding, so that AI can now predict the shape that. So take the DNA and then predict the shape of the protein that's going to come out at the end of past the, the transcription. Yes, exactly. Is is this going to be? Is that what we need? Well, that's like like the theme of tonight. This technology already does exist, and of course we're. Um, uh, using AI for, for things like protein folding and predicting this. So what happens when you take a sample and you do metagenomics is that you can identify a slither of those data based on annotating it, um, based on current available um, publicly accessible genomes. Um, that, and you can kind of um, stitch together the sort of jigsaw of what you're, what you're trying to um, see in those data, but um, most of that data is actually sort of gray matter. Um, it's stuff that's um, it's nucleic acid, so it's RNA or DNA. It's there, it exists, but we have no idea what it is. Um, and so these tools need to work on trying to identify that, and AI will play a big role in that, I think, um, trying to predict that. And in terms of what we can use um, metagenomics in the future is, like I said, in Chinese scientists were doing this already, but it's not um, used in New Zealand. So we don't, our diagnostic laboratories, um, when you have something that looks like an infectious disease, a sample might be tested from your doctor and it might be sent to a diagnostic lab. And they will run sort of a, um, if it's say a respiratory virus, um, like infection, they'll run a panel of known respiratory viruses to see if one tests positive, right? So that panel might include um, flu and RSV and things like that. And before 2020, it wouldn't have included COVID, obviously. And so if COVID-19 had emerged in New Zealand, um, we wouldn't have um, had a test for it. And because we don't um, use metagenomics in, in that setting, we probably wouldn't have picked it up here. And we wouldn't have been able to diagnose it until it probably ended up somewhere, um, somewhere else. And so, you know, our, um, our native bats have coronaviruses. It's not out of um, this world to think that uh, a virus could jump from animals to humans in New Zealand. We just don't use the tools that do exist to accurately diagnose infectious disease here. And that means that we're often prescribing sort of broad spectrum antimicrobials to fix a virus <laughs> infection that's not going to help and it's going to make the problem worse in the long run. That's a bit. Well, so, I mean, <laughs> you've, you've got, got us thinking. <laughs> so, uh, currently, it seems like we, we do a bunch of things where we just we lack information and you guys have the information and we're currently running a whole bunch of risks or or we have a bunch of harms that we that we live with and use of some of these generic technologies will re sort of it looks like it will reduce those harms and provide some benefits but people get quite wary of these new harms and benefits um, and it seems like we're we're pretty good at living with a bunch of harms that we currently have. We, uh, you know, at, at one point in my life, I had a, an illness that lasted for a long time, and at, then at some point I got better, and I realized just how sick I had been. But I hadn't really um, noticed just how, how awful it had been. So it seems like the, the, one of the problems that we have for moving into this sort of you know, nice, nice future is failing to appreciate the significance of the benefits that could that could come, mm. and perhaps being very worried about the risks, even though we're running running risks now. Do you see these sorts of things it, when, when you talk to people about the work that you do? So there, you just gave an example about how we're you know we're currently contributing to a problem for humans and animals, which is antimicrobial 
resistance. Mm -hmm. And this sort of technology could mean that we get um, one way to address that, that, problem, that problem. Do you think people sort of appreciate those benefits or are they more worried about this dystopian future that that there might be with sort of weird weird benefits yeah. that they're that they're not waiting all, all that um, heavily and significant harms you know or harms that they're that they're waiting for. Yeah, I mean I guess it's the um, the type of data that we're generating and where that ends up, right? And I guess this goes back to sort of Justin's idea as well of precision medicine and and what you do with that data. I mean we've all heard this horror stories about you know it being sold like 23 me selling your data to um, health insurance companies and stuff. I mean where where does that um, you know if, if that was a standardized test in New Zealand how does that um, um, stop you know happening here as well. So yeah I mean I think that um, when it comes to infectious disease we can all kind of um, take a step back and understand that that's different from sequencing us ourselves. But the technology that we use to do it does generate those data. So um, yeah, it's what we do with that, I think. That's a question. And so if the people are infectious disease people doing this, this work, they're mm. perhaps not well set up to handle all of that other data, right? So you yeah, sort of need exactly. other people to, to work on that, or yeah, you totally. need people to be sort of polymaths yeah. when it comes to, to, to this. Yeah, I mean, when we generate sort of a meta-transcriptome or a meta-genome, um, I'm really interested in scraping the bottom of the barrel because that's where the viruses are, the tiny little um, parts of the, the DNA or RNA that exist, and I basically throw out the rest of the, <laughs> of, of the data. Um, and, um, and that's where I think we're, we're really not making the most at all of these data because um, it's, it's sort of a waste of, <laughs> of space as well because it's taking up a lot of space. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and you throw it out because it raises ethical problems yeah. that we're not sure about how to deal, how with, to deal with, right? <laughs> yeah, so right. you might discover something yeah. that you think maybe the person wants to know about this, mm. maybe they don't. You go back to the consent form. Mm. Did they say, you know, was there any question about, um, yeah. you know, this? And even, you know, if we're focusing on diagnosing a disease based on clinical symptoms, but we actually um, find another virus as well that they might have. Um, for example, they might have HIV and not presenting any symptoms yet. Do you have a, um, are, are we supposed to tell them about that, you know? Mm. Um, but those are, I mean, these issues, so uh, sequence of metagenomes, because we, do that through uh, we run fecal microbiome transplants in, in mm. people, but you know we, we sequence those and we have a lot of that data. Yeah. And you know we, we have to put that data onto databases. We filter out the human sequence before we do that, so there's no identifiable data there. We don't mine through the human sequence, um, and there are very strict and very clear clinical guidelines about what you report on if you did accidentally find something, and that's all covered in consent forms. That's all covered in you know, very strictly in clinical guidelines in those studies where that is an issue. Uh, so I think you know, there are very, very clear guidelines about that yep. and what you do and don't report to people. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very strictly controlled and ethically. I guess um, a lot of my research not only focuses on, on human um, infectious disease, but I um, will, will work on wildlife infectious disease as well. And most of that is in Taonga species. Um, and, and so when we've sequenced a metagenome from a Taonga species, we've also got their genome. Um, and the data sovereignty around that is also mm. a question. Yeah. So I'm going to do a very mean thing right now, because I had a question for Mike. Uh, and I work with Mike a bit, so I'm going to ask him an entirely different question, but he'll like it, it'll be fun. Um, and we're just going to have, this is going to be like quick, you can see what our working relationship's like. This is a nightmare. Um, this is going to be a quick fire because we've got to get on to some questions from the audience, so I hope that you're formulating right now. So, I'm thinking there's a kind of psychological issue with people, which is that we are much more worried about risk than we are excited about benefit, and we're very worried about risk in prospect. And so if we go back 30 years and we'd said, what if there was this thing called the internet and it knew pretty much everything about you? Um, how would that be? And uh, people would go, what? And you'd say, no, no, we'll give you free internet search. And that would seem like the devil's bargain. That would seem like a useless thing, but actually, 
That's the bargain we all, we all end up, that's the bargain we all live with. Are these concerns just concerns that we need to push through? If there are benefits here and the risks are really small, what do you think? So now I'm making you king for a little bit. Do you think we should just do what Justin and Gemma say and just get on with it? You don't want philosopher kings, James. <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, uh, uh, you can't push through it. You can't push through these things. There's just this fact of people's moral psychology that has to be that has to be dealt with. So we could. I mean. Sometimes I, f I find it useful to do a little test, which is imagine the thing that you're thinking about the future, if that was the present, would you want to change from that? So that's your, you know, whatever this, so imagine we, we, we all have these, these technologies now, we all have the information and we have the healthcare system that, that Justin was, was talking about. If we had that, would we see a good reason to change back to what we have now? And usually, if you think about it that way, quite a few things, you go, well, actually, if that's the way things just were, I wouldn't really want, it would seem weird and perverse to go back. It seems like I'd be accepting a whole bunch of risk, I would be wanting to be ignorant about a whole bunch of things, and it seems like I would be back to treating diseases when people suffer from them, rather than, you know, these sorts of things. And so, you know, status quo bias is, is what this is, is supposed to address. And so sometimes, Getting people to think about things in a different way, imagine it's already here, try and inhabit that world, and that's where the sort of you know, difficult stuff of talking to people, trying to get them to understand what this actually would look like, so they can actually inhabit that, imagine what it, what it might be like. That seems like it's it's useful for making progress, you know, toward that. But that's the that's the really hard hard work, and it's this interface between science and values and those values and people's psychology and yeah. Justin, Justin is dying, dying to come in, but we've in really got to ask the audience a question. We've, we've right? got to have some audience can questions. I'll ask, I'll ask audience. So, how many people here have had their DNA, seen their DNA way to ancestry.com or 23andMe or somebody? Yeah. Did, you, did, you read the, did you read the consent forms? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I, I can buy your sequence. Like literally, it's not a it's not a horror story. I can buy the DNA sequences from 23andMe. Um, if I was that way inclined, I can do something which is called impute the sequence, which means that I would take the genetic sequence that they have and I could impute that up and actually make it more like a complete sequence. So they would sell me 950,000 genetic variants across your genome. I could make that into about 20 million, maybe 20, maybe 30, depending on the quality. Um, then what I could do is I could send that to a company and that company would reconstruct your face um, from that sequence. Um, <laughs> because but, 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 Don't worry, yeah, it's, about, wrong. It'll be fine. it's not something, it's, this, this is a thought experiment. I, I would never no, do that. Just, <laughs> just to make this very clear, <laughs> because there's only 320 measures <coughs> that basically you have to make to do this, right? So it sounds really weird and out there, right? But forensics and, and some police forces do this already when they pick up DNA, and that's about doing the so forensics. So it's not weird, you can't uh, No, we wouldn't, no, but facial structure and... Let's have some questions. questions. Please, Please raise, raise your hand if you have a question. question. Here's one, right there. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. That was amazing so far. Uh, Joanna is my name. I'm doing a PhD in Fine Arts and Genomics using DNA sequencing waste from using flow cells. Anyhow, so first of all, um, I want to respond to the algorithms that are used to recreate the face. Uh, um, and yes, that, that is already offered by the police in the States, but what actually happens is someone has written the algorithm. Most likely that person has been excuse the gender, um, a white male, might have been a white female. In most cases, what happens with the face prediction at the moment still, that might change really fast, is that the face that is predicted is re-discriminating an already discriminated society. And so while we think and we are projecting a lot of everything we know and what we can do and it's already here, what we haven't heard is everything we don't know. 
and everything that you don't know what you know yes you can do these amazing things mm. but how much do you know what other um, uh, effects it has on other material sure. so I was a bit I was kind of sitting here going um, so, uh, so can uh, I just I'll respond to that first yes, quickly? Please. And then so, James could probably jump so in. So I think, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's, I a, there's, 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 yeah. A, couple, there's a couple of points about that, right? So, yeah. absolutely. So, the algorithms and the AI systems that, we, that are used are trained. Now, there are inherent biases in those systems. There are inherent biases in the genetic studies that we've done because there's a lack of diversity in the ethnicities that have been included in those studies because they're predominantly done in European countries with white you know, people like me. And so, absolutely, that's there. No question. Facial reconstruction, those sorts of things, there's a gene, SLC27A, and that gene, the mutations and variants of that gene control skin colour. They are very strongly linked to that. So, there's a lot of things that we do know about some of the variants that actually contribute to these features. There's a lot of other things we know as well. But you are right, there are inherent biases in what we have at the moment, and that's because there's a lack of diversity that's gone into these things. But that is being addressed. Um, in large international studies now that are being run around the world. Uh, being, being so just with my AI, uh, Centre for AI and Public Policy hat on, I mean, I, I agree entirely with that. It's important to note that systems like this aren't hard-coded in the sense that there are people making judgments about what the face ought to look like. What they're doing is they're firing lots of data into a system that's an artificial neural net that's learning. So it's the choices about the data, and are you getting the data from you know just this city or just the wealthy people or you know just people like you? So that's where the bias creeps in. You're dead right. There's, there's plenty of it. We have we no more? Yes. Hurrah. Oh, and then the back row. Great. Uh, so, I was wondering what your thoughts were on environmental DNA. So, there's been wastewater um, detection of COVID and that sort of thing. Uh, what do you think about that with regards to, like, they've detected, we were talking about um, cocaine spikes in environmental DNA in the wastewater around uh, weekend times. Saturdays in London or something. Yeah, Saturdays in London. Um, what about if this technology develops to the point where you could identify individuals as well? Who has the right to own this or like even know about this like information about the communities? I'm looking at Tammy. Mm -hmm. Or oh, am no, I looking no, at Amanda? No. I think you're asking, um, you're asking a, a couple of questions there. So the, the, the metagenomic stuff um, Jim was talking about is about the, the, the bacteria and stuff. So the cocaine sort of thing, I think you'll find they do that already. And I, and I think you'll find um, that actually that they can identify down to house sort of yeah. position. So um, yeah, I, I think that's quite a different thing. And that's police forensics and stuff, I think. But that's, yeah. Um, thanks everyone for your time. This has been really interesting. Um, we've talked a little bit about the downsides of some stuff that can come out of genomics, specifically around ethics and um, systemic biases in the system. But I'm just wondering, um, what are you like really excited about that's going to happen that you think will definitely come to fruition maybe in the next 20, 30 years in genomics or in your field specifically that you think is going to be a really positive thing that's coming out of these new technologies? Great question. What have we got? Thank you. Shall I go? Yeah, yeah. go. <laughs> well, I, again, I think the, um, going back to viruses, because that's what I do, but um, the pandemic has really put genomics in the spotlight, and uh, genomics has really played the starring role because, um, you know, there, we had our prime minister talking about single nucleotide polymorphisms and stuff. And, and, <laughs> and I think that's um, really cool, but, but also shows what can be done. And so, you know, we um, eliminated a really infectious disease in New Zealand, and partly because it was informed by genomics. And, and I think that there's scope then to why not eliminate other things? <laughs> um, do we want measles outbreak again and things like that? We can use this same technology we did, we did for COVID um, to lots of other infectious diseases and eliminate them. And I think that would be a really positive use. <laughs> Anyone, anything else? Oh, Amanda. 
there are a lot of positive things using genome because one of the one of the ones that I think is going to help bring the conversation forward for 20 years is that making these diagnostic pipelines, particularly in the nice security space, which is where I kind of work nicely, is that so when communities can, you know, diagnose them themselves and they're handling the material, you know, it's sexy there and, and sometimes take these kids to the lab and do that. So it's not some alien thing. And I think that's the cool thing, that they can see it, they can control it, they can start to understand it and appreciate what it has to offer. And, and it's increasing those numbers of diagnostic so it takes it away from being this horrible, scary, black box thing that no one ever sees, um, to actually being the hands where they can understand more about the technology. Yep. I agree with that. I think, I think that the education coming in through our communities is going to have a huge impact, but, but you know, the impact on your health is going to be just unreal, right? It, it is going to be unreal. It, from a, from monitoring whether or not your tumours are actually lapsed and they, and they've been treated and they've gone away, we can do that now with self free DNA, you know, and you can see relapse. You can see them come back. You can tell whether or not they need to be treated with another drug. That sort of thing is happening now. These technologies are going to improve and get better and be more applicable, wider access, which is really important, and that's the social issues in that, you know. But, the impact that's going to have on you and your children, I mean, it's it's just out of this world. It's going to be amazing. We've got time for one more question, and there it is, in the back row. Kia ora. Oh, thank you so much for tonight. Um, my question was just specifically about the conservation space and the game changes which could be there. I don't know, Tammy or Amanda, what are your top of mind's like if you could change something in the system or what's legislated or allowed in the country or what's not, um, particularly with pests and predators, I guess, because that's like just a massive pressing challenge. Um, what do we need to change? Because we could change it. Can I throw that to you, well, I think? <laughs> 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 hmm. I think? I think as a response to invasive pests, I think is probably where we're going to see the greatest gains the most quickly. Um, I spoke, the question was about gene editing, but there's a lot of really exciting things that are happening in the genomic space that are enabling us to get a better understanding. For example, within Kakapo, we're at a, a point now where we can we can use really clever uh, clever approaches with with big lots of data and incredible data sets. You know that go back decades, and this is a really important part. It comes through in the human stuff, but maybe not discussed quite as much. Is that that we can talk about these flash new technologies and these ways of generating data, but if they're not connected to metadata, to trait data for decades. There's nothing, they mean nothing. They're just a bunch of, bunch of letters. But it's when we can connect them and we can demonstrate the importance of generating these long-term persistence data sets and actually maintain them and get them funded and take good, really good care of them, then we can start to think about, okay, we may not want to gene edit a kakapo, but we can identify which kakapo chick needs priority and needs to go see a vet. Or we can think about, you know what, actually the reason why this particular male is infertile is because of this. So we're going to mate him or not mate him differently to maintain diversity. And so we're going to get a lot more nuanced in what we do. And, um, and that's what I think what I'm most excited about in terms of, in terms of threatened species. Yeah. And, and for biosecurity, um, it's the surveillance side of things. So that's where, because you have a small window where something arrives, and lots does, we, have, we do a pretty reasonable um, job of capturing most of the 10,000 things that enter New Zealand on a yearly basis. But you've got a small window of opportunity um, before they establish themselves. And once something's established itself, you have to on go and manage it, and that's expensive. And that typically, you put them in a conservation space, it typically falls to Māori communities to do. So I would decentralise a lot of the, the, the EPI, the dot funding, because they honestly, it just drives me insane. And put it to the communities with research, with researchers and skills to help develop those pipelines so they can do the surveillance and manage it before it becomes established. And that's probably where I'd see my thing. Yeah. Can I just, uh, uh, not about conservation, but you know the point about the, the connecting data, 
you know, actually for the human studies, we, we're really good at that. I mean, Dunedin is famous for that, right? Internationally famous for the Dunedin study, which is growing up in Dunedin, has followed a cohort of people through their life, and that's been here, right? There's another study growing up in New Zealand which has been doing the same thing, right? And the data they're collecting and the information there is huge. It's connecting, it's helping to connect these traits together. You know, growing up in New Zealand has genetic data on the individuals. It has the phenotype data. I mean, it's incredible. These resources you know, are intergenerational studies, and that's what we were talking about here, right? These things that go across generations of scientists. It's not about us. It's, it's about the communities, and it's about the people, right? And if you can get it going across generations of scientists, that's when they become really powerful. You know, it just changes the ball game. I would love to keep going all night, but you have homes, I'm sure, and people to see and things to do. Thank you very much for coming. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you, Internet, to everybody who's on the Internet who's watching us, and thank you so much to our panellists. They've just been fantastic. I've thrown them curveballs. Nothing's phased, and please thank the panellists very much.